All right, everybody. It's eight o'clock, so I think we're gonna get rolling here with our GPS site setup basics course. Um, thanks for everybody for coming out here. So um, we're just gonna go ahead and get on into it. Um, so uh, my name is Jake Martinek. Um, I'm with SciTech Northland. Um, so I'm gonna go over some of the training guidelines here real quick. Um, so just since this is a live event, we'll have a Q&A um, section. Um, there's a on your screen. It's up to the top and to the right. It looks like a kind of like a word bubble. Um, if you click into there, um, you should be able to type questions that you may have in there. Uh, go ahead and type away, um, and then we'll, yeah, we'll kind of get those answered periodically throughout the um, presentation. Uh, we'll also take breaks. Uh, it is a longer uh, course, so we'll kind of you know take five minute breaks here and there to lay to either answer some questions or get some questions answered or kind of get up and stretch however you want to do it uh, and then we'll also be recording um, all of these live events here too so you actually can go back and uh, click on the the link that we sent you and then you can see the recorded um, live presentation so you can kind of go back and which watch whatever parts that uh, you see um, fit um, so kind of as i said before here my name is jake marnek i'm with SciTech northland i'm based out of altoona uh, so I'm kind of basically covering the state of Iowa here. Uh, I have experience in software or site controller software. So SCS 900, SiteWorks, UTS, Site Vision, as well as uh, machine control so or software. So Earthworks, GCS, uh, as well as CAD grade and then Trimble Business Center as well. Um, and then I just my background is I am worked in construction, sales and marketing. Uh, and then also today we have Blake Menden with us um, on the call. So Blake, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Yeah, um, I'm the product specialist based out of Minnesota. So I'm your main point of contact for all your equipment and and stuff, all that, all those needs. Um, I've got experience in site control software, machine control, Trimble Business Center, a lot of, a lot of the same as what Jake has said. But uh, yeah, I'm your main point of contact for Minnesota. Perfect. Thanks, Blake. Um, so here's our Ziggler Technology sales team. Um, if you're, you've been with us before, you may notice a couple of changes here. Um, so Will Connell is now a construction uh, software sales specialist, and Jeff Pollock is now a Minnesota sales specialist. And here is our Ziggler Technology support team. Um, these guys are, you know, pretty good at what they do. So uh, if it's kind of a issue that you're dealing with, that's kind of, you know, maybe something actual issue with the software a little more advanced uh, you call this hotline here or maybe we'll direct you there if we can't fix it ourselves uh, and then the team over here in technical support should be able to get you figured out uh, we also have a cert our certified service team uh, they are able to kind of fix any kind of broken uh, equipment that you might have in-house uh, we have spot down here in altoona as well as in minneapolis for that so um, be able to get all your stuff fixed and set in uh, in house. Um, so of course agenda here. Um, we'll go over how to choose a good base uh, position and base post. Um, we'll show you how to create a project, work order, and design and site works. We're going to show you how to connect to a base station using an unknown location in site works. Uh, connect to your. Uh, we'll go over to how to connect to your rover in site works. And then we'll talk about how to perform a site calibration and then how to create machine control files. Um, so the target objectives of this first section would be just you'll be able to determine an ideal base station location um, and then you'll be able to connect to your base station outside. You'll also be able to successfully create a new project within SiteWorks, identify the file types uh, needed for SiteWorks, uh, you'll be able to connect to your rover and successfully calibrate your project and we'll be able to create Trimble machine control files using SiteWorks. Um, so just a, with this picture here is kind of what it's illustrating. It's a obviously it kind of says their GPS overview, but um, basically kind of how the, the GPS works um, with us or with the base station. Um, you, you know, if you have your basic GPS without, you know, a stationary, you know, base station, Per se, it's kind of about as accurate as your cell phone, right? Gets you within 30 feet or so. Um, but you know, with the base station, um, what it's doing 
since it's you tell it where it's at, it's going to be getting all those satellite signals. Um, and it takes where it thinks it's at and where you tell it it's at and basically makes those corrections and then sends those on over to your rover. Um, and then that's how you're going to be getting, you know, kind of that golf ball size accuracy. Um, and the rover is going to be getting satellite signals as well. Um, but that's kind of really how that, you know, makes the rover so accurate versus, you know, kind of a cell phone or just your typical GPS um, is that stationary um, base station. Um, so understanding when uh, GPS will and will not work. So you're going to, you know, obviously want to, kind of as it states there you know look at the job site figure out you know find a good high point kind of deal um, stay away from tree coverage um, you know make sure you're kind of paying attention to obstructions to the sky um, so kind of in this first example here you know you could say this was your job site and you know if you were going to be working in this area you wouldn't want to put you know your base down here at the bottom of this valley or even really at the top of this hill here because you have you know tree coverage on this side and this side um, so it kind of looks like it would be you know more so open like an open field over here it's hard to tell in the picture but it looks you know more open in that direction so um, i'd you know put my base post over here um, it looks like you'd have a clear view of the sky a little bit higher up on the hill um, thing to be aware of is you know you have you know the power lines here so you kind of want to try and avoid those if you can um kind of another example here would be you know if this is you know where you're working obviously you're not going to want to go right under the trees um, like this you would want to go you know off to the side of these trees you know away so you're you know the trees obviously aren't going to be obstructing um, the base station's view of the sky um, that way you can get better satellite signals um, you know if you're going under the trees you're not going to be getting uh, great satellite um, signals and uh, your accuracy is going to get thrown off at the end of the day so that's just something to pay attention to and then i kind of mentioned with the, the first picture that you know there's power lines there um, the ones to really worry about are these type of power lines so your high voltage power lines um, are really the ones that are going to throw it off your typical everyday power lines you can kind of you can get away with uh, those are you know obviously avoid them if you can but those aren't going to, you know, affect you near as much as uh, these high voltage power lines. I'm really trying to avoid um, being near or obviously under these. And then, you know, some people tend to when they're, you know, working, you know, maybe around the building. Um, we've seen it where people put, you know, their base right up against the building. Um, you know, that's obviously going to block, block that whole view of the sky. Um, so you would either want to go, you know, somewhere up you know, on the hill over here, or uh, if you can, it, if you get, you know, the permission or whatever, um, or if you're able to, if you're going to be there for a while, you can um, put that base on top of the building, and then um, if you can, directly, you know, wire it in. Uh, that way you have a really good view of the sky. Um, so base post versus tripod. So a tripod, um, and now if you, you haven't seen the, the, these, this is what they look like. Um, this is usually comes with your base kit. Um, you know, you got your um, Zephyr antenna here, your radio antenna, um, your, you know, long range radio antenna, and then your base down here at the bottom. Now, kind of what these are for is, you know, if you're going to be there for less, as it kind of says, they're less than a week, and really I would say even less than, you know, a couple of days. Um, and kind of, you'd always got to make sure that those are plumbed up when you set them up. Um, so, perfectly level got to pay attention to that and then you know you don't the issue with those is you don't want to have it there longer than a week really because it you, you come on the issue of um, you know it could settle um, it's easier to be moved you know somebody could bump into it and it could really throw your whole side off um, and again or you know heavy piece of machinery drives by and the ground rattles um, something like that and it, the dirt settles um, and then that'll throw your whole side off so it's kind of good for quick, um, you know, quick sites that you're going to be, you know, not on for very long. Now, the other way to go is, uh, you know, kind of obviously the more stable way would be, you know, your base post. So, you know, obviously it's a four by four, um, typically, you know, you cement it into the ground. Um, you know, again, you got your 
Zephyr antenna here, as well as your long range radio antenna, and then your base is on the side. Um, typically, guys are using you know zip ties um, just to so you can hang them there. Um, kind of the benefits of this is you know obviously it's you know cemented into the ground; it's not going to move. Um, and if you're going to be you know if you're going to be at a job site for you know an extended period of time, you know this is definitely more reliable. It's not going to settle on you. Um, I mean, obviously, it's not you know. Machine proof, you know, if you're in a bulldozer and, you know, bulldozer backs into it, that's going to move it. Um, so, you know, you obviously, you know, you want to make sure it's out of the working area. Um, but, you know, still has a good view of the sky. Um, and if you notice here too, um, when you're setting up your base um, posts, um, you know, this base will hold a charge for, you know, six to eight hours or so. But we kind of recommend that, you know, as seen, they have a 12 volt battery here that's wired up to this. Um, that way you don't really have to worry about that base dying on you um, at any point in time throughout the day when you're working. Um, so that kind of saves you a lot of time as to, you know, having to reset up and all that stuff. Um, so just kind of an overview of, you know, kind of what you want. Um, again, kind of I talked on some of this stuff, but, you know, you just as far as when you're setting up your base, um, the general idea is that you want to have, you know, a good view, of the clean, good clean view of the sky. Keep it out of the way of the working area. Um, again, you know, you don't want to be worrying about having to, you know, maybe either somebody backing into it with their truck or hitting it with, you know, an excavator, or what have you on the job site. Um, you can mount it to, you know, a tripod, a post, a building, um, something that's going to be, you know, some form of a, you know, a solid structure. Um, and then you know an access to a power source so a 12 volt 12 volt battery or you can even you know hardwire it in or even you know if you don't have an extra 12 volt battery um, guys can pull up their truck and you know you can hook it up to your your truck battery um, and then you know make sure it's going to be you know an easy setup and take down every day so you know it's uh, you know it's an expensive piece of equipment so you don't want to be leaving that out there overnight typically um, and you want to make sure that it's easy to get to. So, you know, you can set it up the next day pretty easily and take it down and it's not, you know, an issue and nobody's tempted to kind of leave it out there. Um, so some, you know, good base positions here. Um, so you have, you know, this looks like it's on top of, you know, obviously on top of a building or some sort of a tower. Um, it's directly wired in, it looks like. Uh, but it's you know on a solid structure it's high in the sky it's going to be getting good satellite views um, so you'd be getting good accuracy out of that um, same here it's on top of a building um, directly wired in probably as well um, you know again good clean view of the sky and then your traditional uh, base post setup here um, and which is always you know a good route as well Um, so kind of with this picture is depicting here, you know, you have your base post here um, and, you know, your base station set up. Now this is kind of, this is a bad position um, for a few reasons. So, you know, you have your, you know, your trees here, which are going to be blo completely blocking this side of the sky. Um, and then, you know, the question we often get asked is, you know, what about these cars here? Um, you know, it's, it could become an issue. Um, with the set, I mean, with, you know, the radio signals coming in, reflecting off of these cars, um, you can sometimes get away with it, but you're probably better off. I mean, it's an easy thing to move um, to mitigate, you know, getting any accuracy. So we'd recommend that you move these cars as well. Um, and then obviously move this base, you know, farther out into the open. Um, so that is something you want to try and avoid. Um, so errors in GPS, um, so you can get errors, right? So um, there's a number of things that can cause that. So it could be, you know, a number of satellites visible um, could cause that. Um, it could be atmospheric errors um, or even, you know, your satellite geometry, which we'll kind of get into, um, which is, you know, kind of this is an example, you know, your satellite geometry here. So it's kind of it's called PDOP um, or um, I think it's position dilution, um, but basically the idea here is that, you know, bad PDOP would be, you know, you have this guy down here, he's in the city, 
and you know he's probably trying to navigate his way around or whatever but he's basically you know he's got the both sides of the sky blocked here so he's only able to get satellite signals coming from the top really so he's unable to the satellite or his gps is unable to really give him a you know an accurate calculation as to where he's actually at um, so i mean you may have noticed this when you're driving around in the city um, and you're you know trying to you're using your your phone's gps um, and maybe it's struggling to you know get you exactly where you need to be um, that's because you know you're not getting the best uh, satellite signals um, so a good you know position would be you know or good you know example of good pdop or good you know satellite angles would be here so you have you're getting this guy here out on the boat he's wide open so you're getting satellite signals from all different angles um, so those satellites are really to or your gps is able to really kind of better um, calculate where you're actually positioned positioned at on the earth Um, so some there's some other things that you know kind of consider too. Um, so kind of you know again how the GPS or the you know the base station works. So it's you know it's going to be getting um, signals from satellites, right? And it's taking those signals and there's a timestamp um, on each of those signals. Um, and that's you know it's taking all the different timestamps and that's kind of how it's you know calculating um, where you're at. Now. There's a thing called multipathing, which is when you have, you know, satellite signals. So if you're up next to a large building um, or, you know, maybe a large body of water, um, those signals can tend, will tend to um, ricochet off of, the, you know, the building or the water. And that can cause a delay um, in those timestamps or the signals that are coming. So the, the timestamps delayed um, and then that can cause inaccuracies. Now, the you know the base visit the base post and uh, your your base is good enough it you know usually can filter some of that out um but you know again something that you kind of want to pay attention to you don't want to have to really deal with that because you know it can it can still throw off um how accurate uh your rover machine is um so that's you know obviously something to always pay attention to um so kind of in review here um now, what are some key things to look at in a base station position? So, again, you're going to want to make sure you have a clear view of the sky. Um, make sure you have solid mounting so you don't want that to, that base to be getting, you know, adjusted. So, I mean, if it gets, you know, moved an inch, it's going to, you know, move your whole side off an inch. Um, make sure it's out of the way in a safe position so it's not going to get hit by, you know, a car or bulldozer or anything. Uh, and then height. So... Make sure it's you know good if you can get it high in the sky you know the higher the better kind of deal um, that way you're you know getting good satellite signals um, and the radio correction signal is able to broadcast and make sure you have constant power so it's not dying on you while you're working uh, and then easy access for setup and takedown daily um so here we'll actually i have a video um we'll show you how to actually do a base station setup um, so I will get into that here real quick. So it gets loaded. Hey, Jake, did you by chance share it with sound? So if you go to your top of your screen, you should be able to enable sound. Or you may have to pause this and stop sharing and then reshare. And then when you're sharing, you got to hit the share with audio setting. Or I shared with audio from the beginning. Um, Okay. Wonder. Let's see here. Let's see if I can get this shared with some sound here so you guys can actually hear that. Yeah, 
include computer sound. Tell me if you can hear this. Um, this is what does the calculations to send out to your rover. And Better. We can hear it now. Perfect. Better. Okay, perfect. I'll re up, we have the Zephyr restart it here real quick so everybody can engine. hear that good. Um, and then we'll actually set this Try and turn it up if you can. Well, they can turn it up on there. And never mind. First off, we have the SPS 855. Uh, this is the base station receiver. So this has a faceplate on it to where you can see satellites, radio network. Um, base station name, things like that. Um, this is kind of the brains of the operation. Um, and this is what does the calculations to send out to your rover and to your machine. Next up, we have the Zephyr antenna. So this is a Zephyr 3 base antenna. Um, there's a few different types of antennas that could be with your base station, depending on um, you know the age of the age of your base station but if you look at the bottom there's a sticker and on the sticker it, it will tell you the antenna type so right here you can see this says Zephyr 3 base and this is important because when we go through in SiteWorks to set up our base it's going to ask us what kind of antenna we're using so when you set up when you set up the base the first thing you can do is put the antenna on the tripod This will just screw on to the top of your base station tripod. Next up, you want to connect the base station receiver to the base station antenna. To do this, you use the yellow cable that is in your base station kit. And as we connect this on the back of the SPS 855, we have four different connections. If we unscrew these, the first connection here is your radio connection. The second connection is your GPS connection. So this goes to your radio antenna. This goes to your GPS antenna. This port here is used for configuring the base and charging it. And then this is a charging port uh, that can be used with like a 12 volt battery uh, to charge the base as you run it. So when you connect the antenna, you want the straight end of the antenna to connect to the base. And again, I'm going to the second GPS antenna port. Then uncoil the cable. We're going to connect the 90 degree connection to the Zephyr antenna. So once you have the antenna connected to the SPS 855, uh, this is our GPS antenna, so this is what's looking at satellites, but we still need a way for the base station to communicate to your rover or to your machine. So this is where you want to connect the radio antenna. So to connect the radio antenna, again, it's the first port on the SPS 855, and there's also a radio icon just above that port. So we're going to screw this in just like this. Now this is the short radio antenna that's included in your kit. This antenna generally is good for about half a mile of range. Uh, that can kind of depend just on your location, you know, trees, buildings in the area, power lines. If it's a wide open area, obviously you're gonna have a better range, but kind of a rule of thumb we like to use is about half a mile with this short radio antenna. So now I have this connected. I have my radio antenna, I have my GPS antenna, I can go ahead and power on my 855. So to power on the 855, there's a green button right here. I'm just gonna press and hold until I see the Trimble green light pop up. Now it's gonna take a second to load. And once the base station is powered on, you're gonna see four different things on the faceplate. It's gonna say SV, and it's going to start picking up satellites. So right now we're at one, but as it sits here, it's going to find more satellites that it sees uh, using that GPS antenna. On the right, it's going to show your battery level. Uh, a full battery typically will last somewhere in the range of about eight hours. Now that can depend on the age of the base, age of the base, uh, your weather conditions, and things like that. 
If you need more than that, uh, we can hook up a 12 volt battery and connect it to the back charging port. Also on here, it's going to show you your network. So right now we're on network seven. Uh, we haven't set up our base, but right now it's just defaulted to network seven. Um, once we set this up, we wanna make sure that our rover and our machines are running on the same network that the base is transmitting on. The one last thing I'll say is on the faceplate right now, it's just flashing sync. So that means it's not actually transmitting any corrections to your rover or to your machines. Once we set this base up, it's gonna start saying, uh, trans and then sync and then trans and sync and that means it's actually transmitting so if you don't see trans sync uh, then it's not actually transmitting corrections to any of your um, devices in the field so i have it powered on and i can set it up using siteworks so jumping back to the kit now that we have our base station set up and ready to be connected i just want to cover a few of the different cables that you have Okay, so that was kind of your base setup overview there. Um, so let me get back into the presentation here real quick. Okay. Let's get this moving. There we go. Okay, so um, to kind of move on to the next section here, um, we have uh, create. We're going to go over how, over how to create a project, a work order, and design in SiteWorks. Um, and then we'll talk about the uh, Trimble file types as well. Um, so by the end of the section, you know, you'll be able to successfully create a project within SiteWorks. And then you will also be able to successfully identify the file types needed to um, create a SiteWorks project. Um, so Trimble Rover file types. Um, so there's, you know, Three main ones. So you have your DXF, which is you're going to be your line work. Um, you have a TTM file um, that is going to be your surface, uh, and then you have your CSV file, which is which is going to be your control points. Um, and then uh, you'll have a DC file, which is when you go on a calibrated site, um, it'll create this um, DC file, and that'll be your finished calibration. Um, so basically turning files into a project. So what you're doing is you're loading, you know, a DXF um, file or your line work um, and your TTM and then your CSV into your data collector. And then that's going to create the project. Um, so all three of those basically go together and then that's what you see in here on your data collector. Um, so just kind of to enlarge what, you know, each of these files would look like individually. So you know, obviously your DXF or your drawing exchange format um, or your line work would be, you know, would look like this. Um, and then, you know, your TTM or your Trimble tin model, um, you know, that is your surface. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, where you're getting your, your cuts and fills from. Um, and then the tinning, if you're curious, the tinning is like the small little triangles that you see all over the place. Um, so that is the, the tin part of that. Um, and then you get your control points, um, which looks kind of, you know, like a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, your point name, northing, easting, your elevation, and the description of, you know, what that um, control point would look like. So, either, you know, a pin on the ground, a nail, you know, building, something like that. Um, so, just to kind of go over control point uh, geometry, um, you know, over your site. Um, so there is, you know, poor geometry um, and good geometry. Um, so kind of poor geometry examples would be, you know, you know, say this is your whole site um, and you have a control point over here. You got these down here. Um, they're not, you know, in good positions because they don't encompass the whole site. Um, similar to this one over here, um, you know, they're, you know, not around the site. They don't encompass your whole um, job site. So kind of a, you know, the ideal uh, geometry that you would have would be, you know, similar to this. So, you know, really kind of encompasses the whole site. Um, you know, you have, you're getting good geometry. Um, so you're able to, you know, get good readings across your whole site, similar to here. Um, we do get questions, you know, maybe sometimes, you know, what about, you know, this little section here? Um, 
kind of outside of the control points a little bit. And you have, you know, a couple hundred feet or so of play um, you can get away with, um, you know, try and avoid it as much as you can. But, you know, a little bit, a little bit of overhang like that is, um, that's okay. You, you can get away with that. Um, and then as far as control points, um, we do recommend that you have a minimum of five control points um, to accurately calibrate a site. Um, I think sometimes they'll say three, but really it's you want five. Um, that's how you really, you know, get good accuracy throughout your site. Um, so we'll kind of go over um, a tablet and uh, site work startup. Uh, demonstration video here just to kind of show you how to get into that um, before we you know get into the you know the project demonstration and all that so here we'll talk about what to do when you first power up your tablet so your tablets, whether or not they're the T7, the TSC7, the T10, um, they're all going to be Windows 10 based. So if you have a Windows 10 computer um, or have used one before, it's going to be identical or, or similar to that. Um, so if you look on your tablet screen here, um, in the bottom left is going to be the main Windows menu. So if you click on that, all your normal programs will be included. Um, so the one we're going to be concerned with for, for Trimble is the Trimble SiteWorks program. So Trimble SiteWorks uh, is within the Trimble SiteWorks folder in your start menu. So if you hit the drop down, you'll see the Trimble SiteWorks program listed there. It's also going to be on your desktop. So you'll have a shortcut there. And then um, should be pinned to the bottom toolbar as well. So if it's if you're going to use the, sh the shortcut on your desktop, you need to double click. If you're going to use the toolbar at the bottom, uh, just single click. If it's not on the bottom toolbar, you can just press and hold on your short shortcut here and there'll be a pin from taskbar listed there. You can pin it there. So the other folder to note, there should be a shortcut for your Trimble SCS 900 data folder as well. So this folder is where all of your Trimble files are stored. Um, this folder, if you go to Windows Explorer and you go to your your computer and you go to your C drive. You expand your C drive on the left here, or you can click here. The folder is called Trimble Synchronizer Data. So if we click in there, you go to PC. Here's your Trimble SCS 900 data folder. And this is where all, like I said, all of your files for Trimble um, projects are stored. So if you go in here, you should see all the, the different projects listed on your tablet. Um, so if we were to go into one of these, um, you would see your designs folder, DXF and TTM, so your line work and your surface files included. So this is where you would come to copy and, and paste folders to a USB if you were going to take them to a um, to Trimble Business Center or um, things like that. So the shortcut uh, is on your desktop. Um, if not, you can create a shortcut for the Trimble SCS 900 data folder by pressing and holding and hitting create shortcut. And then you can copy and then go to your desktop, click and hold and paste. Now it's going to say it's already there, so I'm going to skip that step, but you can paste it onto your desktop. All right, so we have our shortcut, we have our program there. Um, one other thing to note on the tablet, uh, if, you're, if you find that your finger is working but your stylus is not, you can come to the bottom right and you can hit the arrow facing up. And there's gonna be an icon that looks like a blue finger pressing something. So if you click on that, make sure this is set to stylus. If it's set to finger, it, uh, your stylus is not going to work. If it's set to stylus, it'll work with both your finger and the, the stylus. All right. All right, so now we'll open up Trimble SiteWorks. All right. 
so that was kind of just you know a quick overview um, of kind of how to set up your tablet uh, for kind of the you know the upcoming you know stuff we'll be showing you as far as you know getting into files um, and you know everything um, that kind of follows that so to kind of get into um, the project structure and setup um, so when you actually open up your tablet um, and you know you want to set up a project there's you know kind of a, a structure that it goes through so you know when you're when you have a new project um, that is you know think of that as your main job site so um, that is the whole job site um, and then within that um, so kind of when you you can name it and then so it, something that you just remember it by so say you're working at a Costco, um, you can, as the example there, you can go Costco edition 2020 or 2022 or um, just something that you would remember that specific job site by. Um, and then, you know, you would have work orders within the project and basically what a work order does and it says there, you know, organize the data you collect, but basically um, within the project, you can have, you know, basically as many work orders as you want, but what it does is, you know, if you say you go out and shoot a, you know, a topo over your project and shoots, you know, hundreds of points all over and you don't want to have to see those points throughout the, you know, the life of the project, um, you can, you know, open a specific work order for that within the project, shoot your topo and then, uh, and then that will save and then you can actually get out of that and go back to you know your original work order um, your original setup and then that way you're not staring at those points um, you know the whole time you're working on that site um, and you can always go back um, so you wanted to use that topo for something else um, you can always go back into that work order um, and just load that up and then work out of there and then you'd be able to see it on the project um, and then you would have also a design um, so that's going to include your surface and your line work. So your, you know, your DXF and your TTM, um, those together creates your design. Um, so that, and again, that's where, you know, the surface, that's what's going to give you your cut and fill information. Um, and then the line work um, is kind of what we showed in that, um, you know, used for, you know, the reference and staking and everything. Um, and it looks like what we showed you in that picture of it. Um, so this is the screen that you'll see um, when you go to, you know, you open up your, your site works and you want to, you're going to start a new project. Um, so, you know, there's a couple things here you can, you know, to start, you know, a new project or add, you know, a new, um, you know, add files. You can either, you know, if you have them loaded up already, you can hit this drop down and they would be, you know, loaded up in your, your drop down menu. Um, otherwise, you can hit the plus button um, and then it should bring you. Um, it would bring you to, well, I'll show you on the emulator too, but it'll bring up a screen. You're able to, you're able to name your project, load in the files. Um, and then same thing with, you know, your work order and your design in a similar fashion. So um, I will just demonstrate that here um, on the emulator. So let me get that pulled up here real quick. So I actually have my emulator already open here. So opened up to SiteWorks and this will come up. Um, so this is, um, we'll create a new project here. So you hit the blue plus, um, and then you can name it whatever you want. I'll just name this Altoona site two. And Altoona two. And here, um, so kind of things to pay attention to. Um, so distances, um, you're going to most likely be in U.S. survey feet and I wouldn't even change this unless, you know, um, the files you get from survey or the engineer tell you um, that it would be, you know, in meters or international feet, but typically you're going to be looking at U.S. survey feet. So that's fine. Um, angles, degrees, um, you can keep that there. Um, a lot of this will auto populate, but, you know, it's good to pay attention in case something gets changed. Um, and again, you got your coordinate order. Um, so that is just your point name, normal everything easting elevation and description um, and then for grid coordinate you got your north and east that's perfectly fine azimuth north that's good and then stationing is really the only thing that you know I mean between you know naming your project and the stationing that's really the only thing that you would change if you would like it's more of a preference and that's just kind of how you would like to see your numbers um, displayed um, I like to go this route myself um, so that's kind of how we'll We'll select that. So 
Um, once you name your project um, and everything looks good, you can go ahead and hit next. And then you'll come to this screen. So if you have, you know, files on a USB and you want to load them up, at this point you would you want to select your control point file. So you would check that box um, and then you would go in here and tap to select file. Um, you tap in there and then up here is where you go um, to find your USB. For mine, it's labeled, you know, the D drive. Um, yours might be, you know, say something a little different, um, but just kind of you know, keep an eye out for that. Um, and then you can click into there and it's going to know that it's looking for, you know, a CSV file. Um, so it pulled it up here. Um, so all you got to do is tap that. Uh, hit accept and then that will load that into there and then, so that's good to go so you go ahead and hit finish and then now you want to add your work order so similar process you just hit your plus button here um, and then there's you know no file to add for this at the moment so you just hit um, you can name it whatever you want i'll name it setup and then with your work order too um, it says optional here, so instructions, um, but really this is just kind of, you know, basically you could think of it as like a notepad for if you're, you know, making the work order. And so if somebody else is going to be using it later on, you can leave notes in here, um, whatever they may be about that specific work order. Um, and then you can, you know, enter those notes in. that way they can see them uh, later on when they get into that work order. Um, but once you get it named, you go ahead and hit finish. Um, and then you'll come to your design. Same thing, hit the plus button here. And then you can name your design. Um, I'll just say FG or finish grade. Um, and here you want to select your design file as well as your line work. So we'll go to design first, um, tap into there, and then it'll pull up your TTM. Kind of knows what you're looking for. So it'll kind of get that pulled up for you typically. Um, and you can tap that, hit accept. And they'll load that in there and then similar process for the design as well. And it's no, you're gonna, it's no, it knows you're gonna be looking for, you know, a DXF. So tap it again, hit accept. Once you got those two loaded in there, um, everything looks okay. You get it, your design named, go ahead and hit finish. And then hit accept. And then it should load it up into your data collector. And this is what it'll we'll skip this for now, but typically you'll here um, it'll ask you to you know connect to your base and your rover um, and we'll go over that here later on in the um, in the presentation. Uh, but for now we'll X out of that and then basically if this is your your site. Um, your basic building pad, this is what it would look like and it's loaded up in there. So. OK, so now we are going to go back to. So that's basically how you create a project. Um, it's pretty easy. Um, there is another way to do it, and actually we'll get into that here real quick. Um, so the first method, which is the one that we just went over, um, that is kind of a long method. Um, it, you know, it's however you want to do it, but um, some people want to do it that way. Um, some people will do, you know, the second method, which I'll go over here as well. Um, but the you know the first method is obviously individually going and getting those files uh, and loading them up into uh, site works like that. Uh, the second method would be to uh, copy and paste uh, the project folder that you get from uh, you know survey or the engineer, um, and then or that would or could be created in you know Trimble Business Center. But then you just paste those into your SCS 900 data folder. Um, as it kind of says there, it is the easier of the two. Um, is it that way you can just hit the drop down bar, find your project, and it knows to load um, all of those files in there. So um, the project folder, you know, should be given to you already prepared for site work. So um, you should be able to just, you know, click into there um, and find your project, and uh, then you're good to go. Um, so I'll demonstrate that here real quick. Um, so I'll just go to start a new project or actually let's go to my home screen here real quick. Okay. 
exit out of that. There we go. Okay, so um, you know, this is my home screen, but this is kind of you know could be a different background, but similar to what you would see on your data collector. Um, probably not as many files, but um, you know, it's a Windows based, so it all works the same. So um, I already have my USB plugged in, so. You would want to plug your USB into your um, data collector, but um, from there you would want to tap into this Manila folder. If you don't already have, um, you know, your kind of in the video showed how to get, uh, you know, get your SES 900 data folder, um, you know, onto your home screen. So, but basically what you'll do is you'll go into um, your USB um and you'll find you know i'll use this the business complex text test project um and this is you know my my given folder that you know i say i would got would have got from survey so you go ahead and copy that um and then you can go into actually i should be able to since i have it from the home screen you can go into your scs 900 data folder you can tap into there and then once you're in your SES 900 data folder, um, you can go ahead and um, copy and paste that. So you just paste and then shows that it's in your uh, SES 900 data folder. So then you can go ahead and go into uh, SiteWorks. So we'll open that up here real quick. And so say you're, you know, starting your project and, you know, you have it loaded in, you know, you have that project loaded into your SCS 900 data folder. So at this point, you wouldn't need to hit the plus um, button there. Um, you can go ahead and just click into this drop down menu, find the name of your project. So for me, it was the business complex test project. Um, so I can click that and then I go ahead It already went ahead and loaded everything up for me. Um, so then you can go ahead and hit accept. And then that'll load that into your data collector. And similar deal here is going to make me want to connect to the base. There we go. Yep. And then so that's uh, you know what it would look like. Similar, um, similar process, but um, a lot easier if you you know can just copy and paste it from your USB. Back into the presentation here. Okay. Okay, so um, just to kind of review here, um, you know, there's, you know, the SiteWorks file. So obviously you got your, you know, your three main files. So your DXF, which is your line work, your TTM um, as your surface, and then your CSV um, as your control point file. Um, and then once you can get all those and you get them in there and calibrated, you would have your DC file or your finished calibration. Um, and then you got, you know your initial project set up so um, in the order of you know project work order designs and then you know exit you know the activities would be you know site works project creation so we went over the two methods um, as to how to do that so um, now is a good time if you guys do have any questions about any of that please feel free to you know type those into the Q&A section um, we can try and get those answered here for you um, but other than that we will take a 10 minute break here real quick so you know, it's 849 right now. So let's say we'll just come back around, uh, be back around nine o'clock. And in the meantime, we'll um, try and answer those questions.
All right. So that is, we're at nine o'clock now. So um, I think we're gonna get back into it here. Um, doesn't look like we have any questions in the Q&A section here. Nope. Okay, perfect. All right, so kind of to get back into the, the sections here. So um, kind of up next would be, um, we're gonna go over how to connect to a base station uh, in an unknown position, as well as connect to your rover. So uh, by the end of this, we will be able to complete, you know, a base station set up on an unknown position, um, as well as, you know, connect to your rover and site works. Um, so, you know, uh, as a kind of just an overview here, you know, why do we need base stations? And I kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, but to kind of, you know, reiterate, so there's, you know, uh, you know, you have an autonomous GPS, which is, you know, basically, you know, your cell phone. It's about, you know, accurate within 30 feet or so. Um, but, you know, that's not going to be what you're looking for, you know, when you're grading or you're doing anything like that where you're really looking to get, you know, that centimeter accuracy or, you know, golf ball size accuracy. So um, that's what, you know, the base station does, right? So um, it's the bit you use the base station it kind of says there, it's your correction source. Um, but basically, you know, you, you, again, you tell it where it's at um, and then, you know, it's basically taking where, you know, where it, um, you tell it where it's at and then where you think it's at. And then it's kind of calculating the difference between those. And then, you know, it's sending that over to your rover and your machines and then um, that's how you're getting you know that golf ball size accuracy versus you know you know an autonomous gps where you know you don't have that fixed uh, correction source so um that's kind of how all that you know really works and what makes it you know very accurate um base station set up here so setting up on an unknown position um so basically what you're doing is you're assigning the lat long and height um, after the calibration um, and then that base is going to be broadcasting um, you know the corrections to your rovers and your machines um, and then kind of again the idea here is that uh, the base can't move unless you tell it that it's moved so and kind of what that means is um, you know if you're you know if you're moving between job sites you have you know one base and you're you know you go and set up a job site you got your base set up there and say you're going to take that base to another job site and use your gps over there um, you have to go and actually tell it that it has moved to that job site because it'll still think it's at the first job site um, so you have to go in and tell it um, and you know make sure it knows that it's moved and then similar if you were to go back to the original job site um, you would have to go back in and tell the base um, that it has moved back to that job site otherwise um, it will think that it's at the previous job site. Um, so base station setup. So kind of when you're doing this, the first time, you know, you're doing you, the first time you do this or you do this the first time you're at a job site. Um, it, and then or, you know, when the base moves, kind of as I talked about. But um, so that that's really when you're going to do a base station setup. Um, and then once you get through the setup, um, it's going to ask you, you know, you, you'll calibrate the site and then after you get through your calibration, it's going to ask you, it'll be a screen that pops up and it'll say, um, do you want to save your base position as a control point? Um, and on that, you're going to always want to choose yes. Um, and then once you do that, um, that is going to save that lat, long and height um, in your data collector and then it marks that base station um, on the map and then it'll mark it with, you know, the yellow triangle that you see here. Um, and you'll see that here in um, the demonstration as well. Um, so kind of this is you know what you'll see when you go to um, set up your base. Um, this is kind of this is the screen that you'll see. And thing to notice here is you know the mode. So um, if you hit the drop down, it'll either say base or rover. Um, and you're always going to want to select base first. Um, so don't you know don't select rover always select base first and then you'll go through the setup so um, connection type um, this is you know coming from the emulator um, typically there will be you know you'll be able to do um, uh, Bluetooth here um, but you know you want to go off of your uh, what base you have so 
usually it's going to be your SPS 855. Here it says emulator, um, but you're also able to, um, you know, where the emulator is at, it'll have the serial number of your base too. Um, and you can find that on your base um, just to, oh, so you can make sure that you're using um, the correct base. Um, correction or yeah, correction method, radio and receiver, um, you're always going to want to go that route. Um, and then network ID, basically that's going to be 1 through 40. Um, you have, you know, stations 1 through 40. It does not matter what station you select um, as long as you use the same station. So uh, basically, you know, you select, you know, say you select station 1 here. You're going to want to select that station as well when you set up your rover and then same thing for your machine. So everything um, is getting, you know, the same. It's on the same radio signal. Um, thing to be aware of with that um, is if you're on a job site next to, you know, say another company using um, GPS as well, um, you're going to want to communicate with them that, you know, figure out what network they're on just to make sure that you're not on the same network ID. Because um, if, you know, if you're using the same one, then you're going to start running into issues um, and, you know, inaccuracies, things like that, and it kind of just messes up the whole system. So just communicate that with, you know, other job sites, but otherwise, um, you know, you have plenty of stations to pick from. Just make sure um, they all work together between, you know, base, rover, and machine. Um, base position. Um, when you're initially setting up your base, you're going to obviously, you're going to want to set up on an unknown position. So you always select that. Um, base name. You can name that whatever you want. Just, you know, whatever you would remember it by. Um, that specific base. And then antenna. This is, you know, the big white Zephyr antenna is what it's referring to. And kind of as it was talked about in the video, um, to double check to make sure that you're, you know, using, selecting the right one, because there's Zephyr 2s, there's, I mean, there's Zephyr 3s, 2s, and then there's, you know, a few others. Um, but just to make sure that, you know, you're selecting the correct one. If you look on the bottom of the antenna, you know, where it screws into, you know, the base post, um, right around the bottom, you'll see, it'll say, you know, what model it is. Um, so typically, this is going to be a Zephyr 3, so we selected that. Um, antenna height, um, bottom of antenna, that's fine. Uh, and then correction, CRMX, you don't have to mess with, you know, really any of that. Um, so then moving to kind of rover setup here. Um, so when you do your rover setup, um, it's going to be a Bluetooth connection between your data collector and the rover head. Um, and then the position, you know, it's going to be determined obviously from the bottom of the rover head, as well as, um, you know, we'll tell you'll tell the system that the tip, you know, is at, you know, 6.562 feet or, you know, two meters um, is kind of, you know, the distance of your, you know, your rover rod. Um, so that's um, calculated from the bottom of the rover head. Um, and then the rover is going to be used for site calibration. So basically, yeah, you're using that for, you know, calibrating your site. Shooting points as it says their lines, stake out, verifying, you know, machine accuracy. So um, you can check, you know, what your rover is reading against what your machine's reading um, to make sure everything is lining up. Um, and then, you know, kind of another thing to, you know, pay attention to here is um, a lot of common thing is, you know, a lot of people use a quick release. Um, and there's an option when you're setting up your rover, um, you're actually able to select whether or not, you know, you have a quick release. So if you do have one, obviously you want to, you know, select that because then it will automatically add um, the length of the quick release into uh, the equation so that you're still getting an accurate reading. Um, and that's what your quick, quick release would look like. So um, I'll do the uh, demonstration here on just a base and rover setup. Um, let me get in back into the emulator here. So um, usually it'll pop up and ask you to, you know, select the, you know, connect to your base. But, you know, if you're on this screen and you haven't done it yet, um, you'll want to go up into your menu, um, go to project setup, and then just connect device. And since we're using GPS, you're going to want to, you know, select GNSS. And then obviously we want to do base first. So we got, you know, base, um, we're going to do the SPS 855 emulator, radio and receiver. We're going to go with network ID one. Um, and then this is, you know, 
since we already um, this site has already been technically calibrated, um, it's not going to let me set up on an unknown position in here. Um, but it will typically right here, you're going to um, select, you know, set up on unknown position. So just remember that. Um, and then the base name is going to be hub one. Um, and then the antenna type, again, Zephyr three, and then height and elevation mass, you don't have to worry about there. So then you would go ahead and hit accept. And when you hit accept, um, this box will pop up. Um, and for good practices, we like to say, you know, take a picture of this, um, you know, with your phone or write these numbers down. Um, that way, if the base moves, um, you're able to kind of come back and reference this um, and, you know, know where, you know, you initially set up your base at. But then we'll hit OK. And then your base is set up. So then you're going to want to make sure you go in and connect your rover as well. Um, so similar process. So you would go in and then you go to project setup, connect device, GNSS, and then set up pick and base. We'll obviously go rover here. And then, um, you know, if the rover, it'll, and this will say at the bottom on your, of your rover head too, you can always check this, but uh, it says SPS, it'll, typically it's going to be the SPS 985. Um, so you can hit that. Um, you have radio and receiver. Remember, we did network ID one on the base, so we're going to do that here as well. Um, connected to base, this is emulator. Um, but the, typically that would say, you know, your base name in there. Um, but since we're using the emulator, that's kind of what it goes by. Um, using quick release, typically, um, if you have one, it's kind of a common thing. We'll just say yes here. Antenna height already loaded up as, um, you know, the 6.562 or again, you know, the two meters. So that's fine. You don't have to change that. Uh, and then once you're good, everything looks fine here. You go ahead and hit accept. And then um, now it's wanting me to con check control points here, um, but we don't have to do that yet. Um, but it basically has connected the the rover um, and that's how, you know, you know, you get you get set up on your base and rover and get everything connected. We'll go back to the presentation here. Okay, so again, just to kind of review, um, that's kind of, you know, basically how you successfully complete a base setup and then as well as connect to your rover. Um, and if anybody has, again, if anybody has any questions, feel free to type them into that Q&A section. Um, we can try and get those answered here for you. Um, so course agenda, um, kind of moving on to the next section here, which would be, you know, performing a project calibration. Um, and then, you know, after that, we'll get into machine control files. Um, so by the end of this section, you know, you'll be able to successfully calibrate a project using SiteWorks. Um, so with a project calibration, um, you know, what is a site calibration? You know, basically it's, what it's doing is it kind of says there it defines a relationship between the GPS coordinates and the local northing, easting, and elevation values. Um, and then what's needed for a site calibration, you know, typically you should be getting, you know, when you get the files from survey, they should have um, a CSV file in there. So survey should go out there and actually physically put those control points in, um, and then you're able to go in and shoot those control points um, to calibrate your site. Um, and then that way, you know, it's, you want to make sure that they come from, you know, survey or the engineer. Um, that way, if something, you know, is messed up, you can either, you know, go back to them and say, hey, you know, we need, you know, these control points fixed or, um, but that way, you know, they go out there and make those as accurate as possible. Um, and then, you know, the site calibration is required basically because, you know, it performs the best fit and it fits that, you know, that, um, that site that you get from it, that engineered site to that actual, um, the physical site, the land there. So um, that way, you know, it works between, um, you know, your rover your and your machines um, and everything, you know, it is able to see that site and, you know, you're able to get accurate readings across um, the site as a whole. Um, and then there's also a thing called a note. So there's, you know, the, Calib calibrating the site with given control points. And then there's also, um, you know, say you're going out and you're just doing, you know, making a basement yourself on, you know, the site. You can do a no control point calibration, 
where you know you would make your actual you know your own control points so that's kind of what this is showing here um, so if you didn't have a csv file um, and you're out on a site and you need to you know make control points um, this would come up and again so here you're able to um, you know you, you don't really need to mess with the um, the geoid file um, and then you can name the control points whatever you want you can name it start or you know cp1 for control point one um, and then here is your you know this is giving you the you know your northing easting and elevation values um, but if you're you know putting in your own control points um, we recommend that you change these and i'll show you um, kind of what we're talking about here so given we named so here we named it hub cp1 um, and then since we're making our own control point we're going to want to assign it it's you know northing easting and elevation values um, so we would typically recommend that you know and you can name this do this whatever you want but we would recommend that you do 5,000 for northing 1,000 for easting and then 100 for elevation um, and you can change those numbers as you see fit but kind of that's you know the base recommendation that we give you and the reason being is that that way you know you can avoid getting you know negative numbers um, you know there's nothing wrong if you get negative numbers but it just kind of gets confusing um, you know for operators or anybody that you know would be looking at those numbers um, it's a lot easier to you know just have you know all positive numbers that way you know when you move one direction you know you would have you know 5001 or if you move you know the other direction you'd have you know 4999 kind of deal so um, that's just a good way to avoid those and um, obviously if you're on a larger site you can make bigger numbers in there um, but just something to pay attention to um, but from that point you know you'd hit measure um, and it would bring you to this screen here um, and this is when you're going to want to make sure that you know when you select your control point you got your you know your rover rod it's all plumbed up um, it's perfectly you know vertical um, and you know you have that plumb bob on your that not plumb bob you have got plumb level on your uh, rover rod so make sure that is you know that bubble is in perfectly in the middle um, and then when you're on this screen usually this will populate i believe it auto populates at 15 seconds but you're going to want to change the minimum measure time to 60 seconds um, all of this you're not going to have to change or worry about the measure method just make sure that's bottom of release um, but main thing to pay attention to is just change that to 60 seconds and then the recording interval is at five seconds so basically what that's doing is um, it's taking a shot every five seconds and then it's going to average out those shots over that 60 seconds um, so it gives you a you know much more average reading or much more accurate reading excuse me and uh, so once you get to that point you know everything's you know plumbed up looks good um, you got your 60 seconds in there you can go ahead and hit start um, and then it'll you know come to the it'll you know do its thing it'll count down up in the corner and then it'll you know shoot its point and then um, this is where uh, you know it'll pull up this screen and it'll say do you want to save the base station location as a control point uh, and this is kind of what we talked about before right um, so here you're always going to want to select yes so then you hit yes and then you know it'll save you know, this will save your control point or your hub hub one um, and then it'll be marked with that triangle like that Um, so we actually have a video demonstration of this um, as to how this works um, on the emulator. It'll kind of, you know, shut down my emulator if I actually try and do it on there. So we have a video actually how it's done here. So we'll click into that here real quick. So if you're getting set up on a site and you don't have control points to use, you know, survey has not came out and shot control points, uh, then what we can do is we can set up using a no control point calibration. And so what that is gonna be is, um, you know, we're gonna go in, we're gonna shoot a single point, and we're gonna use that as our calibration, um, and then it's just gonna go from there. Um, so after that, we can burn in new control points, shoot regular points, lines, just uh, go, you know, go about our day as normal as if we calibrated using control points. So uh, to demonstrate that, if you go to the top left, 
and click the menu. You go to project setup. And if you go to project calibration, um, this will be directly after you connect to your rover. You might see this pop up when it asks you to calibrate your site. Um, but it's going to detect that you've not loaded a CSV file with control points, so it's going to prompt you for a no control point calibration. It's going to say enter your rover's local coordinate and press measure to calibrate. So what you're going to want to do here is find a place that is repeatable, say a, a notch on the concrete or you know, put in a pin, a property pin or something like that that you can come back to day to day. Uh, you can use this to check back into uh, to recheck your system. Um, so you identify a, a physical location that you can come back to repeatedly and then you set up your rover on there, make sure it's plumb. And you'll go in here and you can, if you have a geoid or you plan on using a geoid, you can uh, choose your geoid file here. Uh, we won't do that today. So we'll start with a you know, naming our, our check-in point or our calibration point. We'll call this uh, hub one and we'll just um, this will be, we'll come back to hub one every day to recheck in. <clears throat> so then it's going to ask you to enter northing, easting, and elevation. So if you actually had these coordinates, um, you could you could punch them in. A lot of times you're just going to be defining a generic grid. So think of this, you know, as a, if you're looking at a X and Y axis on, on a grid, you know, the, the, where those two lines intersect, intersect is zero, zero. So if you took a step to the right, one foot you would be at zero one you know so it's just you're defining a local grid and so what we recommend is entering five thousand and one thousand for your northing and easting and the reason we use five thousand and one thousand um, is to avoid negative numbers so if you entered zero zero here um, you know as you went west or south you would start seeing negative values and that gets kind of confusing so we type in 5,000 for northing and easting. We put 1,000. Um, we keep those numbers, you know, you know, they're not 5,000, 5,000, just because it's a little bit easier to determine, hey, my 1,000 numbers are my east to west. My 5,000 numbers are my north to south. For elevation, same thing. If, if you have a known elevation, you know, you can check in on that hub at, at a known, you know, you can type in the elevation of that hub. You know, otherwise, you can just define an arbitrary elevation. You could say 100. And just know that everything is based on that 100 elevation at your at your hub. So at this point, we can hit measure. And this is going to be the same static mode measurement that you would see when you're calibrating your site. So, you know, if we're using a quick release, ensure this is bottom of quick release or um, you know, whichever option you're using. You know, these values are probably going to stay the same. The only thing will change. We will want to at least do this for 60 seconds to allow it to get a good position on your hub. So once this is set up, you can hit start. And just like when we're measuring in the control point, it'll, it'll measure it in here. So because we're using an emulator, it'll say the tilt values out of tolerance. Um, we'll just hit yes for today. If you want to save the base station location as a control point, just like a normal project calibration, we always want to say yes. That way, if we move our base station and need to come back, we can set up on that location. All right, let's get back into that presentation here. OK, so um, again, just to get back into the, you know, the project calibration here. So kind of to go over the requirements again. So the survey must, you know, come out and shoot the control points. Um, you know, control points must encompass the site kind of as we you know, talked about on that little diagram or that you know picture there. Um, and then, you know, you're going to want to have a minimum of five 3D control points and, you know, kind of what the 3D means is just, you know, it's got a northing, easting and elevation value um, assigned to it. So um, once you have all those, then you're, you know, good to go. Um, so kind of with, a, you know, project calibration, so there's kind of this will show why, you know, three control points isn't great. Um, so it will work again, but um, it only yield, yields, you know, three baselines as it shows here. But, you know, it's not really encompassing the site, right? So you're kind of, you're missing out over here um, and you're going to, you know, run into a lot of inaccuracies um, and, you know, you would have weak geometry. Um, so this is kind of, this is, you know, what you're looking for 
um, is as far as you know having good geometry, right? So it says four control points or more is better. Yield six baselines. Um, the fourth control point gives you an independent height check. Um, but basically, what you're seeing here, you know, is all these control points are, you know, encompassing the site. You're getting good coverage here, um, good geometry. So you're going to be getting much more accurate readings um, across the job site. So that's kind of the reason behind, you know, why we say, you know, at least five is what we recommend. You know, you can get away with three, four is even better, um, but, you know, five is really um, kind of that that good tipping point of, you know, you're really going to be getting some, you know, better accuracy there and running and in, running into a lot less um, issues. So, um, and again, here's that diagram. So just to kind of reiterate, um, you know, the poor geometry here. So um, with the control points not encompassing the site, you know, we want to make sure you're avoiding that type of, you know, geometry here. So always kind of flip it and this is kind of what you're looking for as far as um, ideal geometry, again, encompassing the site. So minimum of five again. So that's just kind of to hammer that in. I know we always kind of, we already went over this, but just to kind of, you know, reiterate, that's really important to have, you know, those five control points and have them, you know, around the site. So um, fixes a lot of issues if you have that set up correctly. Um, and again, kind of what this um, picture here is illustrating. So, you know, this say this is your job site, um, and these little you know squares here are your control points. And basically, kind of what it's doing is it's you know performing a best fit. Or you know, if you imagine that your you know your uh, your file that you get or your project that from that you get from you know the engineer um, is like you know a big map, and you got to lay it over top of your your job site and uh, you got to pin that map down and basically your control points are the pins um, to hold that map down and it you know creates that best fit for your job site um, so then there's you know project calibration files right so when you're doing um, your project calibration you have a dc file um, which is the finished calibration but then you'll also see and you'll see this in your scs 900 data folder um, but and then you'll see a dot cal file which is the calibration project process so you know if you don't finish the calibration in time that's what you'll see in here so is your you know your your dot cal file um, and then when you get you know that finished calibration file um, which is going to be your dc file that will show up in that um, scs 900 data folder um, so it kind of you know basic navigation when you're doing, you know, project calibration, right? So you write your home screen um, and you're going to want to, you know, hit the menu. So you tap into the menu, you click into project setup and go to project calibration. Um, and then it will bring you to this screen here. So um, this is, you know, down here this is where you'll see your, you know, your horizontal and vertical residuals. Um, but, you know, right now you don't have anything in here because you haven't. Um, you know, you haven't actually um, calibrated any of the um, shot in any of the control points yet. So to do that, um, you go ahead and hit this blue plus, and that'll bring you to um, this screen here, where you can actually see all your control points. Um, and you know, kind of went over this in the video a little bit, but you know, you're able to again select whichever control point um, you like. Um, or if you're, you know, looking for a specific one, you can hit the menu up here. It'll drop down. Or it'll bring up a list, and then you can select the control points from there. You tap select, um, and then it'll shoot your control point. Um, obviously, you got to, you know, do the 60-second measurement. It'll do the shots. Make sure you're all plumbed up here. Um, and then once you hit start, um, that's when it shoots up uh, the control point. So. Um, the next video here um, is, you know, as it says, it says shows setting up on control points. So this is if you're going to be, you know, setting up over a control point or setting up on your control point. It kind of shows you how to actually, you know, plumb that up and um, kind of the process behind that, so you can kind of get a visual of how to actually do that. So we'll run through that real quick. I think this is a pretty short video. to load here. Measure mode, control point calibration. 
Oh, here we go. When performing a site calibration, it's important to have at least five control points on your site. And you want your control points to be spread out and encompass the entire site. The key is that you want good geometry between your control points so that you have better baselines and a better, better position, so a more accurate calibration. So to perform the site calibration, I'm going to choose the control point in SiteWorks, and then I'm going to physically walk to that control point on site, set up, get my rover rod plumb, and I'm going to measure each point for 60 seconds. At the end of that 60 seconds, I'll move on to the next control point until I've shot all of the points on site. At that point, I can perform the site calibration. When finished occupying the control points, it'll ask you to hit finish and accept the calibration. Once the calibration is complete, it will ask you if you'd like to save your base station as a control point. You always want to hit yes. That way, if you leave the site and set up on a different site and then come back to this site, you'll be able to select that base station control point and set up your base on there and be back on your calibration. All right. Let's get back into the presentation here. Um, so yeah, again, that was just kind of, you know, if you're going in to shoot your control points, um, that's, you know, kind of the overview of how you're going to want to do that um, or the process behind, you know, doing that. So um, it's kind of just a review. Um, you know, we went over how to connect to the rover in the base, uh, calibrated our uh, site using, you know, a CSV control point file. Um, and then we saved our base station as a control point. So you're going to want to always make sure you do that. So always choose yes when that screen pops up. Okay, so we're going to move on to our last piece here, our last section, which would be um, create machine control files. Um, and then, so by basically by the end of this section, um, you're going to be able to successfully create machine control files using SiteWorks. Um, so kind of just the basic overview, um, the machine control files um, are going to look a little different um, than they were at, in SiteWorks. So um, again, kind of as it says up there, it's recommended that, you know, the DXF, the TTM and DD files are run through Trimble Business Center um, to create the following machine control files, which would be so if you have Earthworks or if you're running Earthworks, um, your line work and your surface are going to be um, together. Um, and the reason being um, the machine doesn't need as much information as, you know, your your data collector. So um, when you export, it, it'll know to trim those down and then it turns both of those into a .dsz file. Um, and then you'll also get a calibration file, which is, um, it's kind of confusing when you look at it, but it's not, it's not the same file as your, you know, the calibration and process file as you would see on, uh, you know, your, when you're dead on your data collector. So, um, if you're running a GCS 900 system, um, your surface would be, you know, an SVD file. Uh, your line work would be an SVL, or um, you can also use the TTM and the DXF. Um, those kind of work interchangeably on the GCS system. Um, and then your calibration would be, you know, a CFG file. Um, so I'll just kind of demonstrate how to export, you know, files to machine. Um, so I'll pull up my emulator here real quick and show you how to do that. I'll walk through both processes for, um, you know, for, uh, you know, both GCS and uh, Earthworks. So, you know, you're on your um, emulator or I'm on my emulator, but technically, you know, you'd be on your data collector here. So from this point, you'd just go up to menu again, you go down to data management, um, and then you would go export to machine. 
and this is also given you're going to have your USB plugged into your data collector here. Um, I already have it plugged into my computer, but um, that's something to note. You're going to want to have your USB plugged in for this. Um, but so <clears throat> when you get to this screen, um, it'll say, you know, export data type. Um, you're going to want to change that from surface to design. That way you're getting both, you know, your line work um, and your, your surface in there. Um, so you're getting cuts and fills and everything. Um, and then machine control device. Um, we'll do Earthworks first here. Um, these two are, would be, you know, for your uh, GCS system. But so we'll select Earthworks since we're doing that first. And then here you can see it's already got the active design loaded up. So complex FG. And then you can go ahead and hit accept. And then data was successfully um, saved. So um, now if we can go into our, should be able to pull this up here real quick. Yep. So you should be able to go into your USB again. Um, let's click into here real quick. It should give you a project library. If you click into there, um, go into projects, and then your business complex text project would be in there. Um, and then that would be able to, <clears throat> your machine would, you know, pull from there. So um, as long as it's loaded onto your USB, you should be good to go. Um, so then we'll go through the next process here, and it's a similar idea for um, your GCS system. So, you know, project or go into the menu, go to data management, and then go to export to machine. And then you can go surface uh, as, and then change that to design. Um, and then in here, um, so what this is, is, you know, either you have, you know, the CB430 or, you know, you got your CB460, which is the more common um, of the two of the GCS systems. Um, so we'll select that. Um, and then, you know, you select your project. So we'll say business complex test project. Um, select the design that you want. So you have that already loaded up in there. And then similar process, you just hit accept. And then data was success or saved successfully and then OK. And then again, you'd be able to go into your USB and it would be on there and then you're able to uh, basically take that, you know, your USB, plug it into either your Earthworks machine or your um, SiteWorks or not SiteWorks, excuse me, or your GCS. Um, and then it would be able to find those files and those will be packaged up in there um, for that um, uh, for your machine to read and pick up on so um, and then you would be able to you know load those on up and um, get to work um, so at this point um, if anybody has any questions um, we can go through that um, feel free to type them into the q a section um, but that is you know basically everything that is the um, that's the presentation um, we got through a little quicker here today um, but so we'll hang around here for you know 10 minutes or so um, that way if anybody has any questions um, after the presentation or anything like that um, we can get those answered um, so again thanks everybody for coming out and listening um, and tuning in so uh, again feel free to ask us any questions otherwise um, you're free to go <laughs>